good morning students so today we will be discussing about another uh, parameter which is strains so strains as you would see the definition that we give you here that uh, it would be valid for the elastic as well as the plastic condition so strains uh, like the stresses are also a tensor quantity as you would see you may not have used it as a tensor quantity so far but from now on you we will see that it is also a tensor quantity so let's begin with our understanding of this content okay so if you have uh, a cylinder let's say and you apply a force on it and pull it out then the cylinder gets elongated and in the process there is some strain so how does that strain look like? Okay, so let me draw it here. It's not very difficult to draw. So let's say this is a cylinder. And although it looks like it is not parallel, but the sides are parallel. And then you are applying some force, which will convert to stress. So let's say this is the forces acting on the two sides. So it's a uniaxial stress condition, uniaxial loading condition. And we are intentionally making, keeping things simpler. Now, after you have exerted some force on it, then now I will again exaggerate a little bit. There will be elongation in this cylinder and again keep in mind this is cylinder although it may not look like one but assume that it is a cylinder okay so there is some amount of taper that has come out in my drawing but that is not the intention it is inadvertently it has gotten added so the length has gotten increased so this is after you have applied stress and at this particular position the internal resistance force that is acting is same as the force that you're acting from outside. And therefore the material does not extend any further and it stops at this particular position. And therefore we see that the length has increased. Now this longitudinal increase in length is measured per unit length and it is called longitudinal strain. We will come back to the formal definition in a moment for now. Let me just draw it here. So this is the longitudinal strain, but at the same time, you would see that there is also a strain in the other direction. And that is called the lateral strain. So here you can see there is a decrease in length. So this has You see that this new cylinder is lower in diameter compared to the outer diameter. And therefore, this is called lateral strain. Okay, so you would also be able to realize from this drawing that since longitudinal strain is uh, positive, or in other words, it is increased in length, so the other one would have to be decreased in length for constancy in volume. This is when you are applying a tensile load, but you may also have a compressive loading. And in that case, it, uh, the overall drawing may look like, and this time, let me try to make it more cylindrical than the previous time. Okay, so thankfully it has come out a little better cylinder. Now this time, let's say I am applying stress in the opposite direction or load has been applied it's still uniaxial to keep things simple and without loss of any generality but the stresses are in the opposite direction and this time again exaggerating things but not the meaning of things so the cylinder would have decreased in length and the diameter would have increased a little bit. So this is again 
loading and there is a strain. So this is a, the strain in the top one is opposite in sense to the strain in the bottom one. Similarly, if you talk about the lateral, then again, the lateral strain is also opposite from here to over here. So these are called normal strains. However, you may also get strains which are shear in nature, meaning the plane, so the direction of the strain is in the plane of the force where it is being applied. And therefore, these are called shear strains. So for a cylinder type of condition, it may look like twist. So let's draw again the cylinder. So the torque is being applied. So this is a torque and the strain is also, the, this is the plane of the torque and the strain is also in this plane and therefore it may look like this. So what, what it is showing is that originally the line may have been like this, but now that you have twisted it like this, so this line may appear bent like this. And if you open it up, if it were a hollow cylinder, then how would it look like? Let's look at it. So here the stress or the load is acting in this direction and the strain is acting like this. So this is called shear strain. And strain So far what we have understood, what is strain? It is a measure of deformation. So we have seen that uh, there can be two types of strains, uh, the normal strain and the shear strain. And uh, shear strain is uh, acting in the plane where the stress is being applied, similar to what we had as the shear stress. And, uh, Usually it is given by the angle and normal stress is basically just the elongation or compression. Now that you have seen that uh, there is a relation that you must have observed that when you have a positive longitudinal stress strain, the lateral strain is negative and vice versa. Therefore, this ratio is, it's not by accident. It has to happen. It is because of the constancy of volume meaning the volume has to remain conserved. And this ratio is called nu. This is given by negative of lateral strain by longitudinal strain. So if there is already a negative sign added over here. And therefore, when you look at the value of nu, it will mostly be positive. And for an ideal plastic deformation where volume must remain constant, you can easily show that this must come out equal to 0.5. Okay, so you can look at the new ratio for a lot of materials. And what you would see is that for most materials, you can find these on Wikipedia or elsewhere. And what you will find is that for most materials, new is 
is of the order of not equal to, but of the order of 0.3. So what it is telling is that volume is not conserved, particularly when we are talking about the elastic regime. So in elastic regime, anyways, we know that volume is not conserved, need not be conserved. And the value comes out to approximately 0.3 for most of the material, like copper will come out 0.33, aluminum 0.32, stainless steel 0 0.30, and so on. So most of the materials will give you a uh, new of 0.3. So now when we are talking about a strain, there are a few more aspects that we need to be aware of in terms of strain. So what are those? Let's look at those. One is true strain versus engineering strain. How is the engineering strain defined, which is given usually by the symbol E, which is simply the change in length over the original length. Therefore, this is delta L by L naught. Okay, but if you had put it in the differential form, then it would come out to, sorry, this is not the E represented here. Yeah, sorry, it is E then it is dl by l meaning whatever is the instantaneous length change in that instantaneous length with respect to that instantaneous length and if we integrate it with this definition it at every infinitesimal point then you would see that the strain equation will come out to ln l by l naught so this is called a engineering strain or basically a working value of strain And this is true strain. So in this particular case, the strains have been added with respect to the length at that particular time and whatever increment has taken place. And in that sense, it is the true representation of the strain value. Now that we are talking about true strain and engineering strain, let's look at a few more things. Uh, for example, if you are given that the strain values are very small, then you would find that true strain and engineering strain values are very close to each other, are almost equal to each other. The relation between true strain epsilon and the engineering strain is ln, if you look at it, L by L naught. So it is basically one plus E. And therefore, this can be expanded to the form E minus E square by two plus E cube by three factorial and so on. Now from this, it is clear that as E tends to zero, then epsilon tends to E. And therefore we know that for very small values, a strain epsilon approaches E, or engineering strain approaches true strain. So that is one another fact or important point when we are talking about true strain and engineering strain. Another important aspect is that let's say we have, we extend a rod of length L to 2L. So what will be the true strain and engineering strain? So let's calculate E which will be equal to delta L by L naught. So it is delta L is also equal to L naught and this is L naught, therefore this is one. On the other hand, epsilon is equal to ln L by L naught, which L is equal to two L naught and therefore this becomes ln two, which is 0 0.693. Now, if you are given to find the final length, for which uh, final length in compression where strain magnitude is same. Remember we are saying strain magnitude, not value. 
because sign would obviously change. So what you are given is that value is uh, magnitude is same. So it is one, but the sign would be minus one. And this is equal to delta L by L naught. So you have to find what is the L. Uh, delta L is L minus L naught. So you will see that this is possible only when L is equal to zero. So you will have to reduce the length to zero to get a strain value of in compression, if you are doing the compression to get the strain value of minus one. Now do let's do the other thing. I have used a wrong expression from here. It should have been epsilon. Okay, sorry about this. I am changing it because we keep using this and it will become difficult to follow if I keep changing it. So remember we use epsilon for true strain. Now we know that epsilon is equal to minus 0 0.693, which is equal to ln L by L naught. And if you keep this L is equal to L naught exp minus 0 0.693, which is equal to L naught by two. So the final length should be L naught by two, meaning that cylinder should be compressed to half the length to get the value of 0.693 in compression. But we have also added the sign, which is minus 0 0.693. Now look at it. What is the implication? If you take a rod, you double it, the true strain is 0.693. You compress it, bring it back to, to its original length, which is now the new length half. Then you are giving a strain of minus 0.693. So the final change in length is zero. And if you could calculate the total strain is plus 0 0.693 minus 0 0.693, which is equal to zero. Therefore, true strain is also add, uh, you can do algebraic uh, sum and subtraction on it. And that way, true strain looks to be more useful when we are doing mathematical calculations. So now, so we have looked at the fact that what should be the strain value? What should be a final length if we want to get the same magnitude of engineering strain and true strain? Now, few more things. So basically what it is showing is that true strain is additive. And later on, we'll see that true strain is more uh, meaningful in terms of strengthening than engineering strain and hence more meaningful for plastic deformation. Volume change is related to the sum of three normal strains and with volume constancy, epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z is equal to zero for, for plastic strains. And again, when we are calculating in terms of the true strains. Okay, so now uh, that we have some fundamental understanding of the strain, let's look for a formal definition of the strain. So let's, okay, so now I have obtained the access and uh, let's say we have a simple shape like this. So let's uh, name these corners. So let's say we are looking at a three-dimensional object or maybe a two-dimensional object, but whose third dimension is constant and it does not get deformed. But whatever relations that we derive over here would be equally valid. So let's say we start with uh, the name and nomenclature of the corners. So it is A, B, C, and D. Now after deformation, it may look like Okay, so the shape has not come out right. Let me. Okay, so these are the new corners, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. Now, first thing to realize is that whenever you are doing deformation, the deformation will always have some amount of rotation some amount of lateral shift 
and some amount of strain. So deformation will always lead to some translation. Translation is not really changing the shape or shape of the object. So the strain equation should not take into account that. Similarly, rotation is not any shape change. So it should the formal definition of strain should be able to keep that out and then the strain. So the for definition of strain should be such that it is able to isolate translation and rotation or basically exclude translation and rotation. Okay, now here, this is a very uh, infinitesimal small element of some big object. And therefore, this one can be represented as dx. Okay, yes, I forgot to mention that the axis is x and z. So we are assuming the third axis is y. And uh, whatever we derive for x and z will equally be valid for y. Now this is x-axis, this is dx, and similarly, this is dz. And uh, the displacement, let's call the displacement over here. This is the displacement of point A, not the overall displacement. So this displacement is u, and the displacement in this direction is w. Now, this point has gone from here to here, D has gone from D to D prime. Now, if we look at only the extension along the X axis, which is the, so we will have let's name this point P and similarly, let's name this point R. Now, what is the value of, so this is dx, this is u, and uh, yeah, so what is this? D, D has gone to D prime, and what is the overall displacement over here? This is equal to u plus, so this point is going away by u, it must be shifted, D must also be shifted by D, but at the same time, there would also be elongation in this, so that must also be taken into account over here. And that would be del u by del x times dx. Similarly, this point P has gone to B prime. And therefore, this must be shifted by B plus whatever the extension has been over in B prime. So this is equal to w plus del w by del z times dz. So far we have looked at only the normal displacement and extensions. Now let's look at the other ones like d prime and p. So the d prime p, this distance is equal to, so this one is uh, yeah, so the displacement or extension of W along the X direction. So W is originally in this direction, but in this direction, this the gap keeps increasing and that would be given by del W by del X times DX. Similarly, this one would be the extension of U along Z direction. So this one will be given by del U by del Z times DZ. Now with this, if you are now comfortable with whatever values we have written over here, calculating the strains becomes straightforward. For example, let's look at E X X, which is nothing but A prime P minus A prime P by AD minus one. 
So basically, this is your new length along x direction. This is the old length. So if we take the change in length, this is a prime p minus a d by original length is a d. Now we will just insert the values a prime p, which is nothing but this is dx minus u. So we come to this point and this much length. Now we have to add this much, which is u plus del x, del u by del x times dx. So this is dx minus u plus u plus del u by del x times dx. This is a prime p and a d is nothing but dx minus one. So you can see this and this get cancelled out. And when you have dx plus del u by del x times dx, so this becomes del u by, so you can cancel out the dx term in all of these and it becomes one plus del u by del x minus one, which is equal to del u by del x. So the exx term is nothing but del u by And with this understanding, we can now extend to the others, which is EYY is equal to del V by del Y. And EZZ is equal to del W by del Z. So that is the normal strains. Now, if you are looking at the shear strains, So the shear strain is nothing but this angle, which is P A D, D prime actually. So P A D prime, which is approximately equal to R tan. Now, if you are taking the tan of this, we assume this is the theta. So what we are trying to find is theta. So this is tan inverse of, this is the perpendicular, this is the base. So this value divided by this value. So the numerator is del W by del X to DX. And the denominator is nothing but AP, which we had already written here, which was DX plus del U by del X times DX. Now, again, you would see that we will be able to cancel out dx and this will become one plus del u by del x. But then del u by del x is a very small quantity and therefore as compared to one and therefore this can be simplified to just one and therefore it becomes r tan del w by del x. So this is approximately arc. And we also know that uh, theta is approximately equal to sine theta for very small values and uh, sine theta is equal to approximately equal to post, uh, tan theta. And therefore, we can say that this is approximately equal to del W by del X, which is nothing but your EX set. Now, similarly, we can calculate the value of the other theta, which is R A B prime, R A prime B prime. Actually here also we had this prime. So similarly, we can calculate R A prime B prime and you would be able to show that this is nothing but del U over del Z. Now coming to the shear strain, we know the relation that EXZ is equal to one by two gamma. Uh, we don't know yet in the sense of this particular course, we'll come back to this a little later. So EXZ, which is that tensor quantity is equal to this 
shear strain gamma x z is equal to one by two del w by del x plus del w by del z. And this is also equal to one by two gamma z x is equal to e z x. So these we have seen is nothing but the theta that exist between the two axes uh, of the formation. So this is the definition for the normal strains as well as the shear strains. There was a little bit of break and uh, we looked at this equation for the strains, for the normal strains as well as the shear strains. So this is the normal strain given over here and the shear strain and I have made one mistake. So let me correct that it should be del u by uh, del w by del x plus del u by del z. So basically what we are doing is we have two angles, PAD prime and RAB prime, RA prime uh, B. So this, these two angles uh, are A prime B prime, sorry, it's R A prime B prime. Let me write it clearly. And this is also P A prime D prime, P A prime D prime. So the shear strain is basically average of these two. So it may be that in some cases, because of the way that you select the coordinates, this may be zero, one of these may be zero, the other may be, may show the total angle or the strain. And that is why the way it is defined is that EXZ is average of these two. So you sum it up and take the half of it. This is what we are doing over here. And uh, this way you have the strains for the XZ plane. And uh, you can get the strains similarly in the other planes, but right now we are limited to only this plane. So we will talk only about this plane. Now in summary, you can look at the overall, how the equation would look like. So these are the EXX, EYY, EZZ. Uh, again, I have made a mistake here. And it should be, okay, so let me just overwrite here. So it should be EZZ. Similarly here, it is EXZ, which is equal to one by two gamma XZ. So gamma XZ just represents that particular angle. So for example, gamma XZ will represent either B, it will represent either this angle P A prime D prime, or it will represent R A prime B prime. And on the other hand, epsilon XZ represents average of these two. So that you must keep in mind. And with that, we have this equation over here. Okay, so moving on, we have the equations and we must always keep in mind that uh, we would be using these as true strains, which would mean that the strains are So since strains, we are assuming that the, or the other way around, we are assuming that the strains are small. So we can uh, take them as to be equal to true strains. Okay, so moving on, now we will, we have seen the formal definition of strains. Now let's look at strain as a tensor quantity. So you have in the previous definition, you have already seen that there are normal strains and there are shear strains. And uh, for each of the strain, there will be two planes. So basically there will be six shear strains. But at the same time, the material is not rotating. Therefore, two of these strains, the pair of the st shear strains should be equal. And therefore, independent number of shear strains will only be three. So we will have three shear strains plus three normal strains. And therefore, you will have 
something uh, uh, can, if you want to represent strain as a tensor quantity this is how you will represent it epsilon xx And like I said, these two must be equal. These two must be equal. These two must be equal. And therefore, overall, if you look at it, this, these three are basically just the same values as the other three, meaning they are not independent term. And therefore, you have six independent term in this matrix in general cases. And another thing to keep in mind is that when we have already seen that if you are talking about epsilon shear strain, where I is not equal to J. So for shear strain, epsilon IJ, I not equal to J, then this is equal to one by two of gamma ij so this is the uh, way we have defined it so that it fits into this uh, real uh, matrix form or in this tensor form okay so now that we have the strain as a tensor form uh, we can also apply the transformation so the transformation if you remember we had a relation for transformation of stresses in 2D. Similarly, we can have transformation of strains in 2D. And the relationship is same as same relation as you had for stresses. So that is the uh, beauty of defining it this way. We are able to use the same relations and it have it is as if you don't have to derive it separately and everything can be used as it is. Whatever you use for stresses, you can use it for strains. And uh, just that you have to keep in mind that epsilon ij is equal to one by two gamma ij. And another thing is that this is true only for small strains okay so this is also something that uh, you need to keep in mind because i as, as i've said again and again that we are making an assumption that these when their strains are small not assumption but we know that when the strains are small then the engineering strains are equal to true strain and these relations that we have carried out are true for only the true strains so this will be valid only when the strains are small in value now, another uh, thing is that when we are using the stresses as tensor, strains as tensors, then the Hooke's law can also be written in that form. And it would mean that the compliance or the stiffness itself would be a much bigger tensor quantity. So there are nine quantities in general in the stresses and nine quantities in general in the uh, strain and therefore the proportionality constant, which is the stiffness or the compliance, the inverse of it will have a lot more quant numbers of elements in it. Let's see. Let's have a look at it. Okay. So first let's write Hooke's law in tensor form. So if you write the Hooke's law in tensor form, then we know that, it, uh, so you have sigma ij, which is basically sigma uh, one, two, two, uh, sigma one x, or you can say one, two, three, or ij can be one, two, three, or ij can be x, y, z. And therefore it can be sigma x, x, sigma y, y, sigma z, z, sigma x, y, sigma y, z, and so on. And uh, here you have the strain, 
So it is epsilon KL. And uh, this is again, KL is another pair of XYZ, another set of XYZ or one, two, three. And therefore the proportionality constant will have to relate IJ to KL. And therefore the proportionality constant will have C I J K L where C is the stiffness tensor. Now this, from this, what we see is that uh, stiffness tensor would be a fourth rank tensor. Because the stress is two second rank tensor, strain is second rank tensor. So the proportionality constant between these will have to be a fourth rank tensor. But then you would also remember that we have uh, the simplification that sigma, if you remember, go to the sigma, then for Or if we have for the strain, then we have something like this. Now here, as you can see, there's a second rank tensor, there's a second rank tensor. So obviously if something has to relate them, then it will be a fourth rank tensor. But we know that there are three quantities which are not independent here. Similarly, there are three quantities which are not independent here, which means we can write sigma as something like this. So there are six quantities over there. Similarly, we can write strain as this. where sigma one is equal to sigma one one, sigma two is equal to sigma two two, sigma three is equal to sigma three three, sigma four is equal to sigma two three, sigma five is equal to sigma one three, sigma six is equal to sigma one two. Similarly, epsilon one, is equal to epsilon one one, epsilon two is equal to epsilon two two, epsilon three is equal to epsilon three three. We have to clearly define it so that there is no ambiguity about uh, which particular strain does epsilon three or epsilon four represent or likewise, which particular entity does or which particular, particular component does sigma two or sigma three represent because we are, changing the notation from a second rank tensor to a first rank tensor. And uh, coming to this epsilon four is equal to two, epsilon two, three, epsilon five is equal to two, epsilon one, three, and epsilon six is equal to two epsilon one, two. Okay, so now the second rank tensor has been converted to a first rank tensor and which means that even our stiffness can now be translated to a, to a much lower rank tensor. How? So now we can write sigma i equal to c i j epsilon j and where i and j go from one to six and obviously c is the stiffness tensor so now cij or the stiffness tensor 
is relating between first rank tensor to first rank tensor. Therefore, Cij itself is now only a second rank tensor where there, there is six elements in this one, six elements in this one. So it will have 36 elements in general case. Okay. And this is what is represented over here. So this is your very general case stiffness tensor elements. So there are 36 elements over there. Now, just like uh, in stresses and strain, we know that certain elements are same as the other, meaning it is not independent. And this happened to be over here. So your independent quantities So this can be reduced to, so basically, okay, let me be more specific, based on symmetry, oh, sorry, this is not symmetry, based on uh, equivalence of value. This uh, matrix can be, reduced to 21 elements. Earlier we had 36 elements. However, we are not satisfied even with this one because we know that there are something, uh, some more conditions that we can apply and hence we can reduce it. So for example, for now we will apply some amount of symmetry. Okay, we know that it is not a completely random structure. It is a cuboidal type of structure. So for that type of cuboidal structure for orthotropic or orthorhombic structure, what we say, what we call it is that it has a transverse isotropy. So it has now the number of elements are reduced to 5 elements. So you can see even here some of these elements are equal and the rest of them are 0 elements. Actually number of elements reduced is to 9 but five are independent. So you can see there are nine elements over here, but only five are independent elements. So you can see there are one, 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 two, one, three, and again, two, 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 three, and uh, then three, three. So there are six here, one, two, three, nine. So there are total nine elements here, but there are interdependence amongst them and only five will happen to be independent. Now that is for a very um, low symmetry material. We would be dealing with in metals, mostly cubic materials. And for cubic materials, and if we assume that it is isotropic, then these number of elements can be reduced even further. For cubic material, isotropic, we will have, now it has three elements, one, 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 two, and four, four. But there is again interdependence amongst them and only two are independent. Uh, we are not going into the details of uh, deriving how we get to these because it is a very long mathematics and you will probably, but you can take courses on mechanics of materials to understand this. However, since it is useful for us, so we are taking these equations over here for our purpose, because it is good to have a comprehensive understanding about 
one that stress strains are actually a tensor quantity and also the stiffness and what are the various elements that are present in them and uh, what do these different elements represent now that we have uh, stress strain as uh, tensor quantity and we have also simplified it for uh, the cubic materials with uh, isotropic symmetry and we have seen that it has only three elements and two are independent now it is time that we write down hooke's law in the matrix form and this is what we have what we will get so you can see that this is why we were saying you said you saw we have three different elements but only two are independent now this becomes clear over here so you can see there is one minus nu that is one element nu another element and one minus two nu by two so there are three elements but all of these can be represented in only in terms of nu so basically there are nu and uh, so in this particular case there is only one independent element so one there is one element inside the matrix and the other one exists outside it which is e so in terms of e and nu you are able to describe all the different three elements and in fact the whole um, stiffness matrix and here it is given in terms of stiffness but you can also write this equation in terms of compliance which is how this is represented here so these this quantity over here represents the compliance so epsilon is equal to compliance times sigma and uh, both of these equations represent the same uh, hooks law so one is written in the form where you get stiffness uh, tensor the other where you get the compliance tensor so you can see now that basically this is a very simple and uh, easy way to represent stress and strains and uh, even though they are in the tensor form but they are not very scary as it may seem at first okay so now moving on and now what we want to do now, now that we know that stresses uh, and strain are tensors we have looked at the relation hooks law in the tensor form now let's look at the individual components in a scalar way and then we will look at plane strain condition and the plane stress condition so the next thing that we will look at is stress strain relation in isotropic materials which was the last case that we saw over there but now in a scalar form okay so we know that there are um, sigma x sigma y sigma z these which are acting on a material and because of that there will be normal stresses on that and uh, we also know that there will be shear stresses acting on it and there will be shear strains that will be taking in the material in response to that so we will look at their scalar relation so first let's look at the normal stresses so let's say this is the these are the stresses that are acting over here and the strain in the x direction strain in the y direction because of the normal stresses and strain in the z direction because of the normal stresses so stress if it is acting in the x direction or it can be acting in the y direction or it can be acting in the z direction and what will be the strain in the x direction so strain in the x direction because of the stress in the because of the stress in the x direction would be given by sigma x by e strain in the x direction because of the stress in the y direction would be given by epsilon y and it will be in the perpendicular direction and if you remember we have strain which is longitudinal and then lat lateral so this one is a lateral strain and therefore there it will be related by 
the Poisson's ratio nu. We had described earlier, there was the, okay, yeah. So this one, we haven't written the term. It's called Poisson's ratio. Nu. So the strain here would be in terms of that uh, nu. So it will be minus nu sigma y by e. And for the z, similarly, we will have epsilon z equal to minus nu sigma z by e. And that sets up the template. We can write the equation similarly for the other ones. So here is strain in the y direction. Now it is the lateral strain. So there will be a nu over here, minus nu sigma x by e. This is strain in the y because of sigma y. So it is normal. So it is Similarly here, epsilon z, this is lateral minus nu sigma x by e. Epsilon z equal to lateral, so minus nu sigma y by e. Epsilon z, this is normal, so this is sigma z by e. So overall, if you look at the strain, it will be because of, if in a general case, there it will be because of stress in the direction X, Y, and Z. And therefore we can write that strain X, epsilon X is equal to one by E, sigma X minus nu times sigma Y plus sigma Z. Similarly for the Y, It will be sigma y minus nu sigma z plus sigma x. And for epsilon z, it will be equal to 1 by e and this is for the normal stresses. For the shear, we can also get right tau xy. Now here, the, it is uh, conventional to represent this modulus in terms of the shear modulus. This was the elastic modulus, this is the shear modulus. So it is represented like this. There will be tau's. So we have the relation for epsilon and uh, normal strains and the shear strains. And now we will also look at some more relations which come in handy when we are talking about the stresses and strains in the material. So one of the other, so we have looked at elastic modulus and the shear modulus, another constant that is dependent or is interrelated with E and G is the bulk modulus K. It is the ratio of hydrostatic pressure. We have not yet uh, gone into the details of hydrostatic, uh, what is hydrostatic and what is uh, deviatoric. Uh, we are, as for now, just we will define it and then later we will come back and revisit what is hydrostatic. So hydrostatic pressure to the dilation it produces. Dilation meaning volume strain. 
So volume strain is what? Basically epsilon X plus epsilon Y plus epsilon Z. Now, if you look at the above relation, then you can add these and what you will get is this epsilon X plus epsilon Y plus epsilon Z will be equal to one minus two nu by E times sigma X plus sigma Y plus sigma Z. Okay, now K, uh, sigma X plus sigma Y plus sigma Z, which is the diagonal element, this is also, this is what is, uh, the sum of these is defined as the three times of sigma M or the hydrostatic stress. So this can be written as one minus two nu by E times three sigma M. Now bulk modulus, the way we have defined it above, we'll come back and now we will write it. So K is equal to sigma M by delta. What is delta? Basically delta is uh, nothing but epsilon X plus epsilon Y plus epsilon Z, which we have already seen what it is over here. And uh, since again, uh, like the invariance of stresses, there is also invariance of strains. So it can also be written as epsilon one plus epsilon two plus epsilon three. In fact, all the relation that we have written over here, yeah, instead you can replace this X, Y, and Z by one, two, and three. And in fact, we will use it and you will be able to understand it better. So now that we have uh, like this, so we can write is equal to, so we know that uh, epsilon one, two, three is this one minus two nu. So this becomes one minus two nu by E times three sigma M. And now coming to this equation. So we have the value of sigma and we know have the sigma M. So sigma M and by delta. And therefore from this relation, what it comes is that K is equal to E by three, one minus two nu. So this is another handy relation uh, which we use for relating the stresses and strains. So K is called the bulk modulus. The other one is the E elastic modulus and G the shear modulus. And uh, still another relation. So now we have three quantities K, E. So we can also relate G with this. And this one we can do with the help of uh, our pure shear condition. So shear modulus. So this is the ratio of shear stress to shear strain. To get to the equation for this, what we'll do is we will go to the uh, pure shear condition in pure condition sigma three is equal to minus sigma one and sigma two is equal to zero. Now, if we write sigma three is equal to uh, minus sigma one, then we can go to this relation and put the value over here. So again, like I said that here, what you are doing is you can, instead of epsilon X, you can say it is epsilon one, epsilon one equal to one by E sigma one minus nu sigma two plus sigma three. So we'll take this relation and over there, we'll put these condition. Now sigma two is zero because we are talking about the pure shear condition and sigma three is basically minus sigma one. So this becomes sigma one plus neo sigma one. And therefore this is one by E, one plus neo times sigma one. Now for getting the relation for the Shear modulus, we know that shear modulus is equal to tau max by gamma max. 
but what is gamma max? Gamma max is nothing but two times epsilon one, and tau max is nothing but sigma one. So whatever relation we have derived is uh, for the condition of pure shear, but then whatever if it is the relation between G, E, and nu, then it must be valid for all conditions. So G is equal to tau max by gamma max, and which is equal to sigma by two epsilon one. But we have we know that epsilon one is one over E one plus nu over sigma one. Therefore, G is equal to E by two one plus nu. So this is another relation uh, this may, which may come in handy when we are talking about elastic deformation behavior of material. So you sometimes you may be given E, sometimes you may have obtained G, which is the shear modulus, and you can translate or convert from one form to the other, as long as we are in the elastic uh, deformation limit. Now uh, that we have this, now let's, uh, since we are talking about the elastic properties, so let's also look at two special conditions. One is called the plane strain condition and the other is called the plane stress condition. So first we'll look at the plane stress condition. So what is a plane stress condition? This condition defines that your stresses are there only in the plane. There is no out of plane stress. So for example, you may have a sheet, thin sheet like this. And both these uh, cases are in, uh, very useful in engineering because they simplify things without much loss of accuracy of the results. So let's say there is a thin sheet and if you are pulling it or as long as the stresses are limited in, in the plane, so the stresses would stay limited in this plane. And uh, if you're not bending it or folding it, therefore the stresses in the other direction or normal to this would remain zero. So basically sigma three is equal to zero. That is what is plane stress condition. And all the stresses are inside this plane. Now, since sigma three is equal to zero, meaning one of the principal stresses here is zero. So the sigma one and sigma two must lie in this particular plane. Now with the condition sigma three equal to zero, and now we can use again the relation that we had earlier. If we put epsilon one, so again, we'll go back and write those equation as sigma one minus nu sigma two plus sigma three, epsilon two equal to one by E, sigma two minus nu, sigma one plus sigma three and epsilon three equal to one by E sigma three minus nu sigma one plus sigma two. Now, if you put sigma three equal to zero, what you get are relations like this epsilon one, is equal to and epsilon three So this again simplifies the overall relation a lot that you have for epsilon one, epsilon two and epsilon three. And uh, you can put these values in the equation for stresses. Okay, so uh, we can take these two equation and try to get a relation for sigma one and sigma two. So if you write it down, in an explicit form, then what you will get is sigma one minus nu 
sigma 2 is equal to E epsilon 1 and sigma 2 minus nu sigma 1 equal to E epsilon 2. And since we want to find the explicit equation of sigma 1 and sigma 2, what we can do is multiply this by nu and then subtract it or add it, add equation 1 and 2 after that. Then what you will get is sigma 1 minus nu square sigma 1 equal to E epsilon 1 plus nu epsilon 2. Or in other words, sigma 1 will be equal to E by 1 minus nu square epsilon 1 plus nu epsilon 2. And uh, similarly, you can get a relation for sigma 2, which will be equal to E by 1 minus nu square epsilon 2 plus nu epsilon 1. So we have a simplified relation for epsilon 1 and 2. And we have a simplified relation for sigma 1 and 2. This is for the plane stress condition. Now move on to the plane, the other technically useful uh, simplification, which is plane strain condition. So when does the plane strain condition take place? So for example, uh, let's assume that uh, you have a very, very long wire or rod. Now along, uh, so it is so long that the stresses are being applied only in the perpendicular to the length of the wire and the strains are also meaningful only in that direction. But the strains along the wire become negligible or meaningless because it is so long that not much change is taking place along the length. So that condition, what will happen is that you have a plain strain condition. So for example, let me draw here a simple schematic. So let's say this is some section of that. Long wire. So this extends along this direction and along this direction. Now, if you look at this, the epsilon along this direction. So if you let's take uh, element from here. So the strain in this direction is equal to zero. So there are strains over here. There are strains over here. Some let's call it that we have picked up our orientation such that we have epsilon one and two. So there is strain in the one and direction and the two direction, but epsilon three is equal to zero. So this is the condition which is called plane strain condition. And uh, this is also something, as I said, mentioned that this is also very meaningful and you find it very frequently in engineering application. So now when you have a condition like this, when you put in the values, you would see that the equations again simplify. So now that we have epsilon three equal to zero, so we can write the equation like this. But epsilon three is equal to one by E. And this is zero. So basically what you get is that sigma three is equal to nu times sigma one plus sigma two. And uh, now that you have the relation, a new relation for sigma three, you can insert it into the equations for epsilon one and two. And therefore what you get for epsilon one and two are like this. Epsilon one is equal to one over E, one minus nu square sigma one minus nu one plus nu sigma 2 and epsilon 3 we already know is equal to 0. 
So this is again, again, another simplification that we can obtain for engineering applications. So this is for plane strain condition. And these are very useful and helpful to simplify the problems and solve our equations. And uh, we will not to solve a condition right now for this one, but let's solve a problem, solve an example. So let's say that you are given that consider a stress stress state where sigma, this is a example based on what we have learned overall uh, for this chapter. So it is given that consider a stress, stress state where sigma x is equal to 10 megapascal, sigma y is equal to 5 megapascal and sigma x y is equal to 3 megapascal and new or basically it is new is equal to 0 0.3. Assume plane stress condition and find the principal stresses in the XY plane. Determine the principal strains and the largest shear strain in the XY plane, taking E equal to 10,000 MPa. So basically you have 10 gigapascal elastic modulus, E has been given. Now that uh, you have this these values, actually you can solve it in two different ways so let's look at it method one here you are given sigma x sigma y and of course assuming that sigma z is equal to zero we can first find the principal stresses from the principal stresses we can find the principal strains and from the principal strains we can uh, find the largest shear strain. So let's try it like that. So for that, we will need the invariants, which are I1, and you can clearly see that I1 will be equal to 15. And everything we are measuring here is in terms of megapascal. I2 equal to minus 41, and I3 is equal to zero. And then applying it into that equation, which gives us the values of the principal stresses sigma p cube minus 15 sigma p square plus 41 sigma p is equal to zero it boils down to because uh, there is the third stress is zero so it automatically will translate to a sec uh, to a quadratic equation sigma p square minus 15 sigma p plus 41 equal to zero and when you solve it and I'm not going through that solving process, but you can so show that sigma one is equal to 11.4 and sigma two is equal to 3.6. And obviously sigma three is equal to zero. And if sigma one is 11.4 and sigma two is equal to 3.6, then we also know that sigma xy max, meaning that circle, if you remember from the Mohr circle, so the sigma xy max, is basically sigma one minus sigma two by two, which is again 3.9. So 3.6 megapascal is the maximum shear stress. And principal stresses are 11.4 and 3.6. So this is the, the value for the first part. Now we want to find the strains. So for the principal strains, we had said that we can apply that equation for epsilon x as well as in the epsilon one. So we have sigma three equal to zero. So this translates to minus gamma sigma two and one over E in terms of megapascal is 10 to the power minus four, 11.4 minus 0 0.3, which is the value of new minus uh, into 3.6. So this comes out to 1.03 into 10 to the power minus three. That is the strain value, one principal strain, and similarly for the principal strain two, one over E, uh, this time it will be equal to sigma two minus gamma, sorry, minus nu sigma one. So 10 to the power minus four, 3.6 minus 0 0.3 into 11.4, 0 0.018 into 10 to the power minus three. So this is the strain in the, the second principal strain. Now we also need, uh, for if you want to calculate the shear strain, we also need the value of shear modulus. Shear modulus is equal to E by two one plus nu is equal to, uh, you can put in the value and you would find it is three eight four six megapascal. 
and therefore gamma 1 2 is equal to sigma x y max by g which is equal to 1.01 into 10 to the power minus 3 and therefore epsilon 1 2 is half of this which is 0 0.52 into 10 to the power minus 3. So these are strain values and ratio so there are no units for the strain. So that is the first method where we have calculated the principal uh, stresses and from where there we calculated. But the other method is where you don't need to directly find the principal stresses. If it were only to, so in the first part of this, we are actually asking for the find the principal stresses in the XY plane. But if the question was only about the second part, then you would see that we can skip the first part and directly go to the second part without calculating the principal stresses. And that is what this method is about. So this is method two and EX, we will calculate one over E, sigma X minus nu sigma Y. And when you put in the values, you would find it is 0 0.85 into 10 to the power minus 3 and similarly epsilon y 1 over e sigma y minus nu sigma x and that gives you the strains the epsilon x and epsilon y and we can all now we need to go to find the shear strain so the shear strain for that we will still need the g so we'll still use the same equation therefore g is still equal to 3846 using the same equation as above so everything is given e and nu are given so we can directly calculate g and to find gamma x y we can directly find from x and y sigma x y by g and sigma xy is also given over here which is 3 megapascal so 3 by 3846 which is equal to 0 0.78 into 10 to the power minus 3 and therefore exy is equal to 0 0.39 into 10 to the power minus 3 and once you have these values just like for the stresses we can draw the more circle So we, here is our uh, circle, and I'll just shift it a little bit. Here now, let me zoom it a little bit. And uh, one particular condition is known to us. So the values are like this. So we have calculated uh, F strain X 0 0.85 strain y 0 0.2 and epsilon xy 0.39. So one of the epsilon xy will be 0.39 plus and the other will be minus 0.39. So the minus we have the way we have drawn here is in the higher side of x uh, normal stress normal strain. So this one will be 0 And once you have these values, uh, you would be able to also denote where are the principal strains, 1.03 here. And the principal strain here, which will be 0 0.018. And just from the circle, you would be able to derive these values. for calculating the stresses and strains from the given condition. So what we have seen here are that there are two different methods. Okay, so that completes our understanding about the elastic behavior of the material. Next, uh, in the next chapter, we will start discussing about the plasticity of the material. So with that, we close this chapter. Thank you.